Thank you very much. And I love with that uh, great introduction, uh, I would love to kick things off. Uh, maybe uh, starting with uh, the same order uh, you shared our bios uh, with uh, Mariam maybe. I'll, uh, to give us an idea of uh, how is the UN Global Compact uh, and ESG working in this region uh, and what are the opportunities on that maybe. Definitely. Thank you everyone for this opportunity to discuss a very important matter in the world of sustainability that is now becoming a mandate for all companies to join. So first of all, the Global Compact is an entity that is devoted to enabling the private sectors Of course, everyone keeps asking, like, what is the difference between SDGs, the ESGs, what is better to embed? How do we deal with different standards that are out there? So everyone needs to realize that ESG is mainly like a framework that works around numerical scores of the E standing for environment, S is for social, and G is for governance. It has a number of factors that investors mainly are keen on looking at in order to find the best fit you know, company to invest in that matches the criteria of their own investment. So while other um, factors like the SDGs or standards like the SDGs are more of like where the impact areas of the companies are, where do they rather have you know, their sustainability dedicated on which goal? And the GRI is more of a, a sustainability reporting framework that has more materialistic formulas and stuff to collect your data. So the best way to embed a successful model for sustainability is to actually work through all of these together, right? Because as Ivan know, and all of the other panelists would maybe raise this concern that, um, Lately, we have seen a lot of linkage to, you know, ESGs and greenwashing, a lot of talks happening about like, how do we, you know, conduct this into materiality? How do we, you know, reflect on the facts that ESG is not, um, is actually valid and the scoring actually matches what the companies are doing. And again, the best way to do that is to infuse your sustainability with the validating reports that will actually enhance the transparency of your data and for companies to walk the talk of what you promote right and this can also this can only happen through the right integration of reporting through allocating the right impact areas knowing where across your value chain your positive and negative impacts are, are there and how to just you know capture the, the the ones you want to prioritize and start with rather than then just going for a range of areas of uh, reporting thank you maria and on the same note i would like to ask noor uh, to maybe give us some uh, practical examples uh, of uh, how ESG uh, has changed. And Mariam, I do like the, uh, your description of uh, uh, saying it's the numerical uh, uh, approach towards sustainability, which allows for comparability. But uh, how does it uh, uh, cascade down to the private sector? Uh, this is probably what uh, is the most relevant uh, uh, facts that we can discuss at the moment. Uh, Noor, maybe you want to take the, uh, the lead on this? Sure, Ivano. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction first. And I'm excited to be here with you, sharing my insights and experience. Uh, with related to the, our perspective uh, on ESG risks and uh, opportunities, I have to start with, here with that the issues that the companies are currently facing are really very different from those 10 years ago. So as an example, the top global risks in terms of impact and likelihood didn't include the social or environmental issues before 10 or 20 years ago. But today, three of the top five risks as identified by the World Economic Forum are climate related. Uh, we are now in a situation where the resources being extracted from the earth and the capacity of the earth to grow the resources needed for a business are limited. 
we have difficulties accessing talents and returning them to the workplace. So we are nowadays in a situation where our companies have that big dependency on natural capital as well as the human capital in order to be sustainable and resilient. And as per the global data on future predicting, these risks will be increased in the coming years. So this is just to emphasize how important it is to understand how climate and other ESG risks can impact the organization. While on the other hand, pursuing opportunities related to ESG risks help a company create more value and have more long-term success. So particularly from our perspective, this transformation that we are experiencing nowadays, the shift to a clean energy future, and the increased interest from our clients to reduce the carbon footprint, especially we are talking here about the built environment, which is generates nearly 50% of annual global carbon emission as per 2021 global status report issued by Global ABC. So we do have a huge considerable amount of risk in this segment to worry about. And you can notice that this transformation is progressing and continues as we increase the renewable energy technology changes that are making the energy supply and operation more efficient. Regulation and public policies are also changing. Technologies are rapidly changing as well. And it's really not just happening at construction industry only. The other industries, corporates, businesses are also affected by this risk of big changes, including the supply chain, the logistics, healthcare facilities, energy provider sectors, and a lot of other examples. With this in mind, this requires us to be more flexible so that we can take advantage of the opportunities, but also manage the risks associated with these changes. It means you need to develop a business model that can flex to this quickly changing environment. And you can't do that without starting by identifying your own risks that are connected directly to your core business model, your industry sector, and what's important to your stakeholders, employees, investors, customers. And finally, what are your strategies with related to resiliency and growth? Thank you, Noor. Absolutely right. And it's uh, with all these ever changing environments that we have to look also at the context of ESG. Now, for example, uh, I focus obviously, like many others, on the lion's share of the, uh, of the work, essentially the first of the three letters, uh, the E. Uh, but nevertheless, we've seen now international regimes are uh, pushing uh, companies everywhere in the world uh, to actually comply with reporting requirements, uh, focusing on an internationalization of ESG uh, moving forward. And it's probably on that that I will ask to uh, with Sam to tell us a bit about this uh, uh, Global Ambassadors of Sustainability Initiative and how can this even uh, uh, support uh, the knowledge cascading down to the private sector? Yeah, uh, good morning. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee to invite me to be part of this event. So yeah, I would like to share um, a bit on this initiative. And to me, it was an interesting initiative because it is started in uh, 2020, August 2020. So just like two years back in the mid of the COVID-19. And uh, that time uh, I was thinking with my colleague that we want to contribute something from my uh, or our academic uh, backgrounds. So it started just by a simple training program that we uh, start to promote among the students and the practitioners, uh, uh, also, uh, you know, internationally reaching to uh, NGOs as well, industry people. So in uh, the last two years, we, can, we conducted several training programs and this initiative spread, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite fast because we managed to reach to 13,000 uh, people in 130 countries. And uh, the recent program that we uh, uh, concluded uh, recently 
uh, it was a certified sustainability officer, which attract more people from the industry because that fueled and been motivated by the uh, conditions created by the COVID-19, concern about sustainability and um, trying to make the, uh, the business to be more green uh, as part of uh, their responsibility. Uh, and, um, you know, the efforts is being uh, uh, kind of uh, progressive and uh, we keep building a, a global partnership, reaching to more people, as I mentioned again, from the academia, from the industry, NGOs. Uh, uh, and that is uh, uh, a bit of an effort and contribution uh, so that uh, you create, we created awareness among people on sustainability and climate action which is very needed uh, uh, in the uh, recent days because we are seeing a lot of global challenges that need the contribution and the efforts of everyone. Thank you, Wissam. And with that in mind, I would like also to share some of my personal experience. And again, having uh, uh, established the uh, ESG Foundation predominantly as a knowledge aggregator, uh, I offer the opportunity uh, to practitioners like ourselves to have uh, uh, fundamentally a database of comparable uh, uh, documents. Now, when we look at uh, um, ESG, just like sustainability reporting, it's very much storytelling. Uh, and the uh, value of ESG comes from this uh, numerical, quantitative uh, approach. Uh, taken to the KPIs, which are common in both uh, uh, sustainability and ESG frameworks. Now, if we take it a step further, uh, this becomes your ratings, your scorings, and other uh, uh, elements that we already see in action. And what I wish our audience and everyone to ponder about is the fact that uh, you do not need to issue a ESG report uh, to have uh, an ESG rating or scoring. In many cases, investment funds, uh, consultant, uh, potential uh, uh, participants uh, do request the services of ESG consultancies to calculate the score of a company or an investment against publicly available data. So what they actually do is go through the internet evaluate your sustainability reports, your uh, press releases, and come up with uh, uh, an ESG rating to just see exactly where your company sits. And this is quite important to understand because it's not really what you disclose that is important, but it's what you avoid disclosing that becomes the focus of, uh, of the discussions, for especially for uh, uh, those entities. And with this in mind, uh, I would like to uh, probably go back to Noor uh, and ask her to elaborate a bit more on exactly what has changed uh, in the past few years in terms of uh, ESG. I mean, why is it becoming so much more relevant? Yes. Um, uh, I have to say that uh, we can see that the clients are increasingly asking us how far they are building sustainable and human well-being projects, raising their ROI, staying out from the competitors, complying with the HG's reporting, how they can evolve and what that future looks like for their developments and involvement in the built environment sector, and how they can put the right mechanism in place to track and manage the risks associated with ESGs that keeps their targeted customers engaged and attracted to a kind of investment that res resonates with, the, with them in terms of high standards of living environment, while at the same time maintaining a high level of transparency to report to the relevant stakeholders. Um, so I have to say here that um, one way that we can show them how we can achieve transparency in their reporting is through third party certification bodies, such as green building certification and zero certification and other kind of authorities that can increase the reputation and worldwide recognition 
while ensuring a transparent approach towards sustainability and ESG reporting. Another way that we can prove transparency on reporting is by using real-time data. You know that a lot of applications and tools are now available to track um, and provide real data for water, energy consumption, carbon footprint, to show your stakeholders that you are doing what you say you are doing. As a good example here, a few days ago, International Well Building Institute has communicated their newly programmed Well at Scale, which is a program tool to benchmark, monitor, and enhance the people-oriented aspect of ESG strategy to prioritize health and well-being across the entire organization or the state uh, portfolio. So this is a step forward now for us to measure the social impact and track it in, in transparency through reporting to uh, third party organizations. Um, and what we have found at EcoBuild is that ESG movement is also helping to drive innovation uh, where our internal R&D experts have been working to develop a monitoring system with an end user interface to connect and engage people in their build environment by understanding the environmental parameters that can affect people's health uh, comfort and productivity on a real-time data collection to track and monitor their sustainability and environmental KPIs, which will help the facility management team to be more proactive and transparent with related to ESG's data collection during the operational phase in the real estate portfolio. Another creative example of using technology and getting the opportunity of ESGs to enhance the end, use, uh, end customer or consumer experience was presented at the Gulf Sustainability Awards on 2021 and has won the first place for innovation and sustainability. That large B2C corporate not only decided to improve their environmental contribution by the initiative of planting mangrove, but they have engaged their end consumer emotionally in the process by developing consumer interface uh, app, app and informing them that they will plant a tree for each product is brought. And in this case, the end consumer has the feeling of good self uh, social contribution while purchasing and consuming from this particular company. And this idea has increased their sales dramatically, standing out easily from their competitors. Um, I want to close here that I believe that we are moving towards a time of a real time reporting and high expectations for transparency. That's how quickly things are changing, especially with the increase of expectations for providing information to investors and to customers. However, uh, I believe that the market is still evolving to provide a holistic approach for real data collection, private and transparent at the same time, especially with the intangible goals. Thank you, Noor. And I'll, um, although I'm not familiar with the initiative uh, uh, that you mentioned from the Gulf uh, Awards, uh, I do wish to pay a word of caution on, uh, uh, on offsets. Uh, I'm not against it. On the contrary, I think that uh, uh, in the golden years of uh, the clean development mechanism, uh, carbon offsets uh, uh, actually harvested the collective power of private sector towards initiating a reform uh, towards green energy. However, when we look at initiatives uh, uh, such as tree planting, we need to make sure that those are regulated by uh, the correct methodologies. So uh, the actual unit is not the tree being planted. That is a very notable and valuable approach. Uh, it does, as you say, create an emotional link uh, but it does not uh, uh, link up to the framework that, for example, the SBTI, the Science-Based Target Initiative, addresses as uh, uh, nature-based removals. These have to be duly uh, registered under either a UNFCCC or voluntary methodology, and those are part of much bigger uh, uh, initiatives. So even though in philanthropic terms, it's uh, a a very laudable uh, initiative uh, in practical terms. Uh, it doesn't really provide the level of uh, um, tangibility uh, to the end user. And maybe on this note, uh, I'll, uh, I can ask uh, 
I'll, uh, for the panel, uh, um, starting from Mariam, uh, maybe, for uh, uh, ways to avoid uh, potential greenwashing or uh, uh, elements of uh, uh, miscommunication. Exactly. So, Ivan, I do agree on everything you said, and I think this is what we have seen. And uh, a lot of companies are taking this as like, you know, a trend. Let's just put the ESG out there and let's have this uh, communicated to our clients. And uh, we will put a lot of like, you know, those easy wins of the, the green environment, uh, whether it's let's plant a tree, let's uh, do something for the waste, let's recycle here and there. The main core of sustainability comes with the three spheres together, which is the environment, the social, and the governance. So neglecting one over the other does not perform sustainability, right? Focusing your efforts on just putting some environmental measures does not qualify your company to say, well, listen, I have a sustainability story. No, you need to work on the three elements in parallel. Now we have seen a lot of like, um, you know, like what happened with McDonald's in 2019 when they were, you know, contributing to more than uh, 54, you know, metric tons of CO2. And in their ESG ranking, they were just upgraded. So this was really, uh, you know, highlighted as, why is the ESG looking at things from the profit of the company's perspective rather than what is the actual cost? The same happened with Tesla. And they had, you know, a higher score because of like the EV, yes, on the concept, it's very environmentally friendly. However, the cost of the lithium on the environment, the governance that Tesla is, is suffering from is contradicting with these uh, uh, stories. So this is why it is very important to know that when you promote your company's effort in sustainability, you need to walk your talk. You need to provide data that supports, you know, a strategy of sustainability that is infused with the core of how you work. So this is why we always say, look at your value chain, you know, start by assessing your uh, impacts, where is your negative one, where is your positive one, link that immediately to those areas of impact that you want to have, and then start defining a specific KPI that you will work along, have the materiality of the data that is reported through GRIs, and then reflect all of that on your ESG scoring, then you have consecutive layers of data that whenever you promote something, and you are conducted, you know, or, or and now nowadays, everything is out there on the social media, and as you mentioned you are actually you know um just audited for what you are not saying not the messages that you are laying out there so make sure that you walk your talk you have the data that supports on different layer you walk the three pillars in parallel and that all of the factors that are contribute to your methodology of the strategy of the sustainability is really transparent thank you mariam i do agree uh, word for word and there is a lot uh, more to be done. I mean, my personal take on this is, uh, um, is predominantly on disclosures. Uh, yes. And just like uh, uh, the panel today, obviously, if we were uh, a board of directors, I'll be the one pushing for the environment, you <laughs> might be the one pushing for gender. And this is where diversity, where the three letters play a role. Uh, with Sam, maybe you want to also add something, a different take. Uh, on this, on disclosures, greenwashing, on tackling uh, uh, hurdles. So maybe my view will be a bit different. Uh, I mean, in the holistic uh, context, uh, because I'm originally an environmentalist, so my master's and PhD and fellowship, it's on environmental engineering, air pollution, climate change, and sustainability. So the approach that I, I would uh, love to see that the companies uh, will approach sustainability as a, a kind of the core uh, activity of the business as a responsibility to the community. It's not only as a risk uh, part of the business because it, if we tackle it as a risk means if there is no risk, so it's, it is, it is okay to have air pollution, water pollution, or waste management. So that approach that we have to think about it. I know that the companies will look more on profits and the losses, 
that is the main uh, approach of business and also the risk to the business. But uh, we have to think about it uh, uh, in terms of uh, ethical and uh, social responsibility. And uh, I believe this is not tough. This is not difficult to be implemented if uh, from uh, the uh, early stage of uh, starting a business. And that is the role of the policy making uh, bodies that we have to conduct environmental impact assessment for each economical activity. Whether it's a small or large activity, we have to know what is the expected. We have to predict the environmental impacts and we have to put a plan for mitigation that we uh, uh, will save the community, will save the planet, and also will we'll keep the business and economies uh, running and uh, people will start, uh, will get profits uh, uh, as well. So this is the, I mean, we need kind of a change in the process of uh, starting businesses, of approving businesses. And that's if you, we look at the global scale, we will see kind of a diversity, a variety in, in, in the uh, practices. But this is uh, 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 to me as part of, uh, you know, if I'm, Looking back at my experience in the universities or with the industries, I think that can be done. But we have to have a very strong policy and regulations and enforcement as well. Because in some countries, from my experience, they have a very old, a very strong uh, environmental constitution, but they have, they still have uh, pollution in their rivers. Uh, they have businesses who dump waste in rivers. And uh, in, in some of these examples, we can call these are developed countries with a very economical uh, activities and also uh, environment. That we, So just to give you an example, last year, they managed, the people over here, they managed to recycle 600,000 of construction waste, which uh, uh, resulted from the war, and it is being used in the construction industry. Secondly, I just concluded a study on plastic recycling as part of the circular economy approach over here. And we just learned that we have 75 factories who are recycling plastic, who are recycling 20 ton of plastic waste every day. So if these activities can be done here in Gaza, I believe it can be done everywhere in the world. If you can do that with a very tough economical situation con and conditions over here, I think this can be done everywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Wissam. And the love, again, very, very relevant. Well, at this point, we can take a few questions uh, from, uh, uh, from the chat. Uh, we have a question. I'm not sure if anyone uh, uh, in the audience uh, wishes to address it. Um, that asks uh, uh, about our uh, notion of the concept of degrowth uh, and how does that impact the ESG? I'm not personally familiar with the degrowth, but uh, I would assume it's something related to the reduction of uh, consumption patterns. Uh, anyone wishes to take this question? Well, um, Ivana, degrowth is about, you know, prioritizing the environmental preservation, right? So it is about looking at things from an environmental uh, preservation perspective. Now, this is good. Again, there are so many initiatives out there, you know, to, to help preservations and so on. But again, when we speak about sustainability, when we want to look at the bigger picture, right? So this is why ESG is, is like, you know, tackling the three spheres of sustainability, as I mentioned, in order to cover not only the environment, but also to cover the social and the governance. So here comes the difference between both if you want to compare. Thank you, Mariam. And uh, on, uh, on that uh, note as well, there is another question for you and Noor. Uh, if you have any experience with the uh, newly launched uh, ISSB, the International uh, Standard uh, like created by the 
IFRS uh, on sustainability. Itself. Yeah, well, again, this is also coming from an accounting perspective, and it is used to support the entries of the uh, ESGs. So it's actually a very good, um, you know, uh, standard that that works with accountant and 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 financial, uh, let's say, measures that are working around principles rather than rules, which gives a lot of flexibility towards uh, working with it, but it has um, a good sense of so uh, solidating the data that comes within the ASGs. Thank you. Noor, maybe you want to add something on it? Uh, I don't have any background about the, the latest standards, which, uh, as she said, that's related to finance more, but I can... Uh, I stress here that um, it's the transparency for for any uh, kind of reporting. Uh, it's related to to your core and values. So you need to start with the strategy. Go through ESGs and the RM. Try to assess where uh, are we as an organization, where we need to be. Uh, where do we have the biggest gaps? Uh, where are the opportunities that relate to a business model? That can be a real practical way of taking something that may seem overwhelming at the beginning and create real business opportunities from it, but also to uh, prove to your stakeholders um, that you are doing what you are doing uh, without declining any sensitive uh, data um, that can affect uh, the full process. Thank you, Noor. I see also we have a lot of questions related to offsets, uh, uh, tree planting, and uh, uh, carbon uh, emission uh, uh, certificates. Uh, if uh, you don't mind, I'll take that because it's my bread and butter. Sure. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, we have to think that uh, is, I'm not personally against offsetting. On the contrary, I do believe uh, it's an economic tool that allows to start with the low hanging fruit, moving onwards to the more complex uh, uh, projects. Uh, having said this, uh, it's the, the way we utilize carbon credits is uh, what is relevant and what makes it uh, viable. Now, under the Paris Agreement, we are discussing what it's called Article 6, which allows for these carbon credits to be recognized from the origin country to the receiving country. Now, when you have a transaction which is recorded under Article 6, it creates an internationally transferable uh, unit. And this is a real mitigating action. The reason it makes it real is because it's not double counted. And again, I don't want to, uh, to seem uh, um, a negative about the concept of double counting. But most often, uh, it just happens for reasons behind uh, even the knowledge of the project, simply because a country might record in their greenhouse gas inventory their forestry, as an example, but some of these credits may have been sold to me. So both me and the project developers might claim the credit and therefore, without an Article 6 transaction, it's very difficult to keep record of who does what. And again, we were talking just before about uh, uh, the, the IFRS, how a financial accounting standard is getting into uh, sustainability. But this is the essence of it. Sustainability is becoming quantitative. These are transactions, just like in finance, that are a credit and a debit. And as a result, everything is evolving around it. Methodologies like Vera, for example, are uh, there to register to quantify emission reduction from specific projects. The same way the clean development mechanism and hopefully the future sustainable development mechanism uh, will do as well. Having said that, uh, I wanted uh, to ask a question to Wissam, if possible. Uh, there is a question in the chat addressing uh, uh, expertise uh, and trying to understand and uh, uh, how to uh, 
identify the correct skill sets uh, when looking at ESG and sustainability. Uh, given that you have your uh, ambassadors uh, and you are uh, involved in training as well, maybe you can uh, uh, advise the audience. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, talking not only about the skills uh, and expertise, we, we have to have the basic, uh, which is the awareness of everyone starting from the community and it is uh, we have to have uh, you know the knowledge and the uh, awareness on all the environmental challenges and uh, that should be kind of upgraded when we talk about the industry uh, people on how to make that as a part of their uh, practice when we understand the context of the environmental challenges their impacts and not only their impacts on 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 the environment and health we have to monetize that value of impacts, the negative impacts in terms of uh, uh, an impact on the economy itself. Because I have some interesting numbers, and this is uh, all from international reports. When we talk about one of the single, one single uh, uh, pollution, which is the air pollution. So we know that, that air pollution is killing 7 million people every year. And the interesting part, when we talk about air pollution, like in, in China and India, we are talking about in China, uh, we are losing 1.8 people every year. And China is losing $900 billion every year because of air pollution. And in India, we are talking about 1 million people dying because of air pollution and 150 billion USD as part of the loss because of air pollution. So all these knowledge, we have to uh, kind of promote for every layer of the community up to the uh, uh, you know the economical sector and the industry people because that will change our mind uh, uh, set to think more positively not only to think about the pollution as a burden that we need to buy technology to control it that we need to spend because if we don't spend at that part of uh, the uh, pollution control We'll, we will have to spend it somewhere else and it is more on health and treating the environmental uh, uh, elements. But again, I am stressing here that this, uh, this is not only the responsibility uh, uh, of the community or the government, it's the responsibility of everyone because we need the efforts and the integration of the efforts of everyone to think positively about the aspect of the relationship between the environment and the economy. I mean, there is no contrast between both because finally, if we don't consider uh, uh, both of them alongside, uh, uh, so we can make profits, but we will have to be the losses at uh, uh, certain parts. And uh, also we will have a lot of losses in terms of humanity, in terms of human factors, in, in terms of fatalities. So we have to balance all these needs, the economical needs with the environmental concern and the environmental uh, protection. So, and uh, as part of our initiative, we focus on the part that we can contribute. And maybe just here to mention that the initiative started up to now, we are running on a zero cost, all the training being offered free. And that's the interesting part. That's why people, they are, uh, uh, coming and the increasing a uh, number. So we are contributing our knowledge. We are increasing the experts, the expertise on uh, the sustainability aspects on integrating sustainability in businesses. And I think this is a, a real need uh, on the global uh, scale. Thank you. Thank you. Ivano, uh, if I may please just add a very, very important note, right? Sure. So I have worked with different companies on embedding sustainability strategies and actually implementing the change, right, regardless of the industry. So we were facing this, you know, the companies that are bringing in consultants to build the sustainability strategy and to, to put the KPIs and then they just leave and no one is able to carry on the job, right? So I want to raise a, raise a very important point here. Do not look at sustainability as a project, rather infuse it with your processes. Because 
everyone in your company has a role to play to actually contribute to sustainability from top management to labor level. And if you do not do that, and if you do not actually implement it and teach your people, and I, this is something I personally do. So I do specific training on function, how HR can contribute to sustainability. What are the best practices for, uh, you know, um, uh, sustainable construction, sustainable procurement, sustainable sales, and so on. Because it is not a one-man show. It is not for the CSO to sit there and just, you know, report. There are pe people to actually do those initiatives to think sustainably to generate more idea to have the entire company actually working towards achieving the goal of the sustainability of the company so it's not a one-man show you don't need an expert to come and tell you actually invest on training your people all of them to actually contribute to that and only then you will find a successful sustainable company. It is really shameful when we see companies that are saying, well, you know what, we are uh, communicating big stories on sustainability achievement. And when you talk to their employees, they have zero clue what sustainability stands for. So I think, you know, it's just embedding the notion that it is a process that everyone caters to rather than just, you know, bringing in the expertise uh, to come and do the work and leave you. How are you going to sustain this? How are you going to continue working sustainably? How will you report on the KPIs if you do not understand what are the sustainability? What are the sustainability measures? What do they stand for? How to report on them? So let's shift from bringing in expertise to training our people and to actually making this, you know, a 360 degrees uh, view for all companies. Mariam, you're absolutely right. And it always goes back to that concept we started with, which is the E, the S and the G. So this yes. is essentially the governance. If you do not embed it within the governance, uh, it's just a nice report that will gather dust on the, uh, on the shelf. Uh, I just want to super quickly address one question that I saw between rating agency and where to start. Uh, again, uh, from my point of view, uh, sustainability reporting is always a good place to start because it allows different entities uh, within the organization to participate. Uh, my only recommendation there is to make it as participatory as possible. Include also your stakeholders internal and external. And in terms of rating agency, uh, I've dealt uh, consistently uh, with many of them. Uh, and the most important thing to consider is that on average, uh, rating agencies are really, really lazy. So unless you specifically spell out that you have this policy and you do that, they will not do the legwork to find it on your behalf. So this is a very strong collaboration with your uh, comms department to make sure that your sustainability ESG strategy is clearly available on the public domain. Uh, and moving forward, different rating agencies have different weighted averages. It really doesn't matter which one uh, is better, which one is worse, is do your own storyline start bad and show how your organization improves over time. And with that in mind, I just wanted to have uh, maybe Noor's last uh, uh, comment before we close off and uh, uh, pass the mic back to the organizers. Yeah, sure, sure. I agree with all the panelists' uh, opinion, and uh, I want to stress here uh, to end it by the integration of ESG risks to the business risks. Uh, which I think also would cover some of the questions uh, that have been raised. Uh, it's frankly to say it's all about setting the right strategy for your firm. Um, and I have to stress that each company has its own journey around sustainability or ESG. For example, if you are an, ener an energy provider, your risks are related to carbon emission and your opportunity is with green energy system efficiency. If you are a factory, you will like to put water consumption on the top list of your ESG risks. So it's truly culture at the company, top down, bottom up, that needs to be identified, measured, prioritized, and uh, set the right KPIs, as Ivano said, then controlled, monitor, and refine. While you should put into your considerations that this process should be implemented by multidiscipline approach, as Miriam uh, has highlighted. So 
as I said, for successful integration, you need to start by identifying this ASG strategy based on your unique exposure to risk. After that is done, it's time to connect the ESG strategy to business strategy and ESG risk to the overall risk statement. Uh, in other words, ESG integration should be a core part of the vision, mission, and values of the company. And all ESG risks should be considered in the overall risk statement to ensure that the enterprise risk is adjusted based on all the treats instead of just standard financial or business risks. After this integration and alignment, you need to make sure to put the right components in place to manage ESG risks as part of the risk management framework, such as the policies, procedures, performance monitoring, and the KRI, and without forgetting to focus on the management structures and government structures. So uh, what you need to have here is a mechanism to tweak your ESG strategy, tuning it, refining it, so it gets better and better as you go along without falling into the trap of repeated practices or one-time risk assessment.